Galatians, the Bible says that, there it is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, whenever we pray in the Holy Ghost, these fruits are applied to our lives. We can have that meekness in times whenever we feel boastful. We can have that gentleness whenever things get rough. We can have that peace whenever there seems to be a storm in our lives. That whenever we pray in the Holy Ghost, God imparts these things to us because it's His Spirit living in us. It's His Spirit working in us. And through those fruits of the Spirit, the Bible says that they will know that you're my people by the, your fruits. Yeah. And that whenever we pr display those fruits, people are going to see that, you know, we are people of God. So we also, you know, that, that they know that we're people of God by how we love one another. Well, one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. And the Bible says that God is love. So whenever we get the Holy Ghost, we get those fruits. Also in Jude chapter 5, it says, verse 20, if I can find it. But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So whenever you're down and whenever your faith needs rising, the Bible says this is a way to build up our faith is by praying in the Holy Ghost. That whenever we pray in the Holy Ghost, that God lifts up our faith because it is God literally inside us. And our faith can be raised and our faith can start to move mountains. And the Bible says that praying in the Holy Ghost, it creates intercession for us. So we're praying for things that we don't even know what we're praying for. God's using our mouths to pray for his people and to strengthen his people. And our faith can be lifted through that. I know that there was a time in my life where I was praying in the Holy Ghost and I didn't know what I was praying for. Then suddenly it hit me. God said, I'm praying for a missionary. You don't know this person, but they need their strength. And that helped raise my faith that God's doing great things through me, through the Holy Ghost. That whenever I don't know what to pray for, God knows exactly what's needed. So if we can just go before the Lord tonight and pray for a desire to pray in the Holy Ghost, if we could all stand and pray tonight. Lord God, we thank you for everything you've done. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord God, to have your spirit live inside our lives, Lord God, that you can move, Lord God, and that you can direct our path, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we ask, Lord Jesus, that we get that desire to pray in the Holy Ghost, Lord God, so that the fruit of the spirits can be alive in our lives, Lord God, so that we can display them, so we can be an example to our world, Lord Jesus, so we can show that love to people who are hurting, Lord Jesus, so we can show that meekness, Lord God, in times where people are saying, well, you should be proud of this, but we say, no, it's all God. Lord Jesus, we're going to give you all praise, Lord God. We're going to give you all glory, Lord God, for you are good and you are mighty. We bless your name in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, everybody. This focus prayer here is just more or less we need to pray for a revelation on how powerful it is to pray in the Spirit. I had no idea what Brother Seaton was going to use in his focus prayer, but he just introduced this one. You know, it's not about speaking in tongues. Let me say that. But it's about letting the Holy Ghost have its way. We want God to have his way. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which means the Spirit lives inside us, which means the Spirit ought to be leading us. We need to be sensitive to that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Why? Because, verse 20, we are bought with a price. Therefore, we need to glorify God in our bodies and in our spirit, which are God's. So, therefore, I know there's times when we're down, we're praying, and we don't really know what to pray for. The Spirit is right there warning us to get out of the way and allow him to come through praying in the spirit you know it's been like and like this it's been said that when we pray we can pray at the speed of sound and we know sound is 768 miles per hour but when we begin to be sensitive to the holy ghost we begin to allow him to use us and to speak through us and we begin to pray in the spirit it's been said that we let the Spirit speak through us in our prayers, and we begin to pray at the speed of light, which is 186,240 miles per second. That's just how powerful it is when we allow God to use us. When we begin to be sensitive enough to Him, let the Holy Ghost take over. 
Paul even said in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayers and supplications in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's stand as we pray and ask God to help us to have this revelation. Let's also ask him to help us that we can be more sensitive to him. I know there's a lot of things that's getting our attention. It pulls on us, but we need to stay sensitive to the Holy Ghost, even in our services like tonight. Let's pray. Join your voices with me. God, we thank you tonight. God, we come before you asking you, Lord, for that revelation, asking you, Lord, to help us, God, not only to understand how powerful it is to be in the Spirit when we pray, God, but to allow you, Lord, to use us, to be sensitive, Lord, to the Spirit. God, help us, Lord, to feel out the Spirit, to help feel out after you. God, to know which way you're leading, to know how you're wanting to lead. God, when we begin to pray, we pray, God, for things. There's things we don't understand, and we, we want you, Lord, to come through. We want you, Lord, to be able to speak through us. God, just help us, Lord, with that revelation. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to you, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. I'm thankful for his Spirit that's working among us. Praise God. If you would just remain standing tonight, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer for prayer request. We received a Facebook message today from a lady by the name of Shirley Jones. I don't think she's ever been here before, um, but she had requested prayer for her mother, Arnita. Arnita has had some heart trouble and uh, is in the Jackson Hospital tonight in desperate need of prayer. And uh, I know we have others that are in need of prayer as well. It's good to have James with us tonight. I know he mentioned he was having some things going on in his body and needs prayer as well and doctor's visits. Linda Alley uh, continues to need our prayer tonight and uh, we will continue to pray for her and her situation in her body and uh, more doctor's visits coming up next week and uh, probably will be another couple of weeks for some more answers, but we're believing the Lord's able to touch that. If you have a need tonight, would you just lift your hand? Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you, O oh Lord God, that you are on the throne and you hear and answer prayer. And God, we come to you tonight on this Wednesday night in our midweek Bible study and worship time. And God, we bring needs before you that are presented today. I pray for Arnita today, this family reaching out to us, asking us to pray for her. God, that you would touch her body. Not only are you able to touch the heart spiritually, but I still believe, God, you're able to heal this body as well. Reach down into that hospital room, I pray, God. Give that touch of healing that is needed. You know needs that are represented in this building that we lifted our hand. And we may not have spoke anything about it tonight, but you know the thoughts and even in the intents of the heart. And God, we ask tonight that you would work for our good. Minister, O oh Lord, in this building. Use this service to edify and as even we will take communion after a while. Build this body up today. God, even we may be broken as you were broken, but God, you were broken so that we might be whole. Let this service mend, I pray, God. Let it serve the purpose that you would have it to fulfill tonight we ask in Jesus name we pray somebody say amen you may be seated tonight thank you for standing in your prayer time this evening our ushers are coming I know you say man we're rushing through this tonight we have communion this evening and I tried to call there was a couple of people I tried to call today I knew that didn't get the text alerts and uh, I didn't even get to leave a voicemail it just rang and rang and rang so if you didn't know about tonight pastor did try to reach out to you and I apologize for you not getting the word we meant to mention it over the weekend and uh, just didn't get mentioned. But this is what we do every year, Holy Week, uh, on Wednesday night uh, before Easter Sunday. We take and we do communion and uh, we do the foot washing service afterwards. If you need a towel and would desire to be a part of that, um, we will be able to accommodate there. But we did ask you to bring one if you were able to this evening. And uh, it's going to be a good flow tonight. We're still pushing for uh, probably about 10 minutes till 9, maybe 9 o'clock getting out this evening. We're just going to allow the Lord to work. I, I do believe... Uh, that there are some symbolisms here, but it, there, it is important for us to understand that as often as we would do this, that we do this not for us, but in remembrance of Him. And so we will talk about that tonight and try to have a good flow into that. But we're just going to focus on having good church first. I believe the Lord uh, dropped a word into my spirit this week. And uh, if the Lord can talk to you in an airport, He did it this week and talked to me as I was sitting there waiting on our plane to come in for us to leave Orlando. And uh, I just want to talk to us about another subject this evening and then we'll move into this time and we won't rush any part of this service this evening but I appreciate you coming to the house of the Lord we give to our Sunday school department on Wednesday night let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this offering Lord Jesus I love you I thank you God for what you're doing in this assembly among our children Lord to even events that we have going on this weekend bless our Sunday school department bless
bless those that would teach our children tonight in their classes, we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. They're coming to you tonight. Let's worship together. Thank you for the joy of the Holy Ghost.
together tonight and just lift up a praise to the Lord. Let's glorify him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Again, we're getting into the word just a little earlier tonight so that we don't feel rushed in the end of this service. If you would, let's stand together tonight. It's a very short text. Won't be standing long at all. Going to Proverbs chapter 4. We'll be reading one verse tonight in verse 18. As you're turning there, and I know they're already projecting that, I do want to say thank you to those that kept things running back home. And uh, not saying we didn't think about things back home. We didn't worry about things back home because we knew we had left things in good hands. And uh, I know you had good church this weekend. I've watched the morning service and I've watched the Wednesday night service. I hadn't got to Sunday night yet, but I know you had good church this weekend. And I appreciate you coming on and worshiping the Lord together. And uh, it's good to get away sometimes and push that reset button and uh, be able to come back fresh. And I appreciate you allowing us to do that. Proverbs 4 and verse 18. And we're going to read this passage together tonight. And then it's going to be a little bit before we, um, before we actually announce our title. So they'll end up going to a welcome screen for a little bit here. The Bible says, The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Now we know the perfect day is when the Lord comes back for His church. I don't believe it's the will of God for us to shine less and less, but actually we should shine more and more. That as this world gets darker, we are to shine more and more. As our culture still changes, the church ought to still stay the church and shine more and more. But I want to take you to another way to view that because more and more is more than just continuing to shine the same light, but as much as I believe there are new areas God wants to take us as God's people. If the end time revival is going to happen the way the Bible says it will happen, then we will have to step out in faith and let God take us from faith to faith there are places that we must go thank you for standing tonight you may be seated when and uh, we're going to get right into this this evening again thank you for standing in honor of the word of the lord tonight faith allows us to leave the old life and walk toward new horizons in the plan of god somebody say take the plunge now that is a that is a uh, expression in the English language that a lot of us are very familiar with. According to, I know this, this is really a website, I promise you, I'm not just making this up. You can go there after church, usingenglish.com. This figure of speech, according to this website, says if you take the plunge, you decide to do something or commit yourself, even though you know there is an element of risk involved. So whether finally deciding, deciding to marry after a long engagement or quitting a job to pursue a business startup you have been dreaming about for years, the decision to take the plunge is a little bit nerve-wracking. Somebody once said, the way to spell faith is R-I-S-K. The writer of Hebrews would tell us, 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Faith sometimes, and I say sometimes, it requires us to believe something that cannot be seen with the human eye or to expect something to happen that we really don't have any concrete proof of how it happened, but we know God was involved. And so to step out in faith and to believe God for the impossible is a little like standing on the high diving board. You want to jump, but the thought of doing it can be paralyzing. Uh, we got back to, to uh, Florida and, you know, I, I figured at least it had her, her fill of water. And the very first thing she wanted to, to do, she saw the swimming pool. She knows we don't go to the swimming pool when it's full of people. And so she saw there was nobody in the swimming pool. And she says, oh, Dad, I, I want to go swim. And I thought, my Lord, girl, we have been out of town for five, six days. And all you've wanted to do is be in water. And you still want to just get in water. And so we went. But, but she didn't want to, you know, jump in. She wanted to step in. Well, her mama tricked her. She got her to stand up on the little ledge, and, and uh, we're trying to, uh, I say we're, no, Kelsey is trying to teach her to swim. And uh, so she is uh, telling her, you've got to hold your breath, baby. You've got to hold your nose, shut your mouth. And uh, that's the big one right there, shutting the mouth. But anyway, uh, she hold your nose and shut your mouth and go under the water, and you're going to be okay. And, and, and. But she would always, on the way down, go, oh, no. And then all of a sudden, her mouth filled with water. You pick her back up. She coughs that junk out. And it's like, we're going to do this again. Well, after she had done that a couple times, Kelsey thought, well, maybe the element of surprise will work. And so she stands her up on the ledge. And she says, now, now you know that when you go under, you're supposed to hold your nose and, and, and close your mouth. Yeah, Mom, I know. And so we were standing there just talking about something. Next thing I know, Kelsey, she's standing down in the pool. And uh, next thing I know, Kelsey just kind of reaches around behind her pushes her off well she did it that time she kept her mouth shut and held her nose and then from that point on she would do it on her own it took an element of surprise to show her she could do what mom and dad had been saying she could do there are times in our life where God knows you have more faith in you than you realize and there are circumstances that will happen that will force you to use every ounce of faith that is inside you to get to that next place God has designed for you to be. But once that leap is made, however the, the excitement of jumping can be and what it causes you, whatever you were questioning uh, and you were scared of in the first place, that's all gone. And so it is when we step out in faith and we begin to do what God has asked of us, we may fear and at times we may even doubt whether I don't know if God can even come through in this situation but whether we take the plunge and we reach for his promises the joy when we do that and the excitement of watching the Lord come through it will make the challenge worth it all and so tonight we are continuing this this lessons learned from from ladies or women in the Bible and tonight's sermon we're going to talk about take the plunge into new horizons there are things that God wants to take you to and there are places God wants to bring you to but you've got to be willing to use your faith there are two ladies that I want us to look at tonight who contributed to God's plan and they could not be more of a contrast we're going to talk about Rebecca and Rahab tonight Rebecca a virgin that lived in Haran um, Haran rather and Rahab a harlot living in Jericho neither Rebecca nor Rahab could have anticipated what God had in store for them their backgrounds, though starkly different, were both headed for new horizons. Rebecca, the grandniece of Abraham, and Rahab, an unknown harlot without pedigree, surrendered to the plan of God that thrust them into roles of righteousness that are a challenge to us as believers today. Now, although not everyone around Rebecca was a believer, she was born into a family that respected and worshipped the one true God. Her great uncle Abraham yielded to God and we talked about Abraham and Sarah a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night who uh, the Lord told them to leave their country, their kindred and go to a land that the Lord would show them. Rahab, contrasting her life, she was surrounded by idolatry. But her yielding to the will of God was more of a miracle than it was Rebecca's decision to go with the servant to become Isaac's wife. When Terah, Abraham's father, left Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia, he and his family migrated approximately, they tell us, 600 miles west to the area of Mesopotamia known as 
Haran. It was here that Rebekah would grow up. It is not known how much of the family still believed in the one true God. At least enough of them believed for Rebekah to be exposed to some sort of the truth. Um, Rebekah's father, we know his name was Bethuel, son of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Bethuel probably farmed and raised livestock. Um, Rebecca's duties consisted of the normal domestic duties of housework. She would go to the well. She would draw water for the needs of the household. The latter responsibility is what brought her to the well when Abraham's servant would arrive on a mission from his master to obtain a wife for the master's son, Isaac. Abraham who had previously immigrated from this area to the land of Canaan, approximately 500 miles south of Haran, uh, ordered his eldest servant, you go to Haran and you find among my kindred a wife for my son Isaac. And it's commonly believed this servant was Eliezer, mentioned in Genesis 15. And so Abraham had made Eliezer a promise that he would not select a Canaanite woman for his son and that he would bring a bride to Isaac. Abraham was concerned that his son, even after Abraham is gone, he wanted his son to remain in the land of promise. And so Rebekah, though an insignificant maiden, had this... uh, enviable pedigree, if you will, as the grandniece of Abraham. She was kin to scriptural nobility. And although she would later become more of a role player in the drama of redemption, Rebecca was already privileged to be influenced by those who believed in the one true God. But this other lady I want to talk about tonight, Rahab, she was well known in Jericho. It was for the wrong reasons, however. She was employed in one of the oldest yet infamous professions known to man. She was a harlot. The Bible says she was not just a harlot, but she was the harlot who lived on the wall. That may have been her distinction. Uh, She had a certain place that was well known. The reason I say that is because that's how she was first described when we read about her in Joshua. This is all that we know of her until two Hebrew spies come knocking on her door. And she was used to having male customers knock on the door at night, but she had never opened her door to men like these men. The Israelites had left Egypt. They had rejected their first opportunity to enter the promised land. And consequently, they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And we all know the story. They were now at this border of the promised land for the second time, ready to enter the land promised to Abraham and his seed. Joshua, their leader now, I think it's interesting. I want you to note this. He doesn't send 12 men. He sends two men. Why does Joshua do this? Because Joshua and Caleb were a part of a group of men that went in with 12. That's right. yes. And he said, you know what? Sometimes the strength is not in numbers. Because sometimes you can become quickly the minority when it comes to your faith. And it's too easy for us. You know what the Bible says? Birds of a feather flock together. And it's too easy for us to start going with the crowd and going with the the, the rest of everybody else and just doing things to be doing it. And Joshua says, this time, I'm going to learn from the mistake. And we're not going to have to come back to this border a third time. He said, I'm going to send two men. Because there was only two men that came back with a good report the last time. And so he says, okay, this time we're going to send them into Jericho. I'm going to send them into a specific place because this is the next battle that we need to fight. And so only two, the last time came back with a good report. Now, it's not obviously Joshua and Caleb going in this time. We do not know the names of the two men. But he says, I I, I don't want to go back and have to march around in this wilderness for 40 more years. And so he knew what it was like to be in a minority. But no, the will of God is not what the majority is saying, but it's to conquer while the majority was saying we cannot do it. I said that to say this. Sometimes to experience victory you need to surround yourself with positive and godly influences. You will not live in the fulfillment of God's promise till you learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Until you learn God will do what he says he will do. And sometimes it means I got to take the plunge. And sometimes it means I got to exercise my faith in ways I never have before. But when I exercise my faith and I give God the situation, I know he's going to bring victory out in the end. 
And so instead of sending 12 men, I thought it was really interesting to see Joshua said, nope, we're going to go with the number that brought back a good report last time. We're going to send two men in. Joshua wanted to know something of the military strength of Jericho. And, and so that would, that would basically enable Israel to prepare appropriately. And it was these two Hebrew men that knock on Rahab's door and uh, expecting a customer, she opens the door and unknowingly she welcomed two Hebrew spies into her home. And so when the king of Jericho heard that these two men from Israel have entered the city and they've went to Rahab's house, he sends messengers to her and orders her, you bring forth these men. And so she tells the messengers a lie that the men had left that evening about the time of the shutting of the city gate. In reality, she had hidden these spies in the stalks of flax upon the roof of her home. And so when the threat had passed, Rahab speaks with the spies, letting them know the inhabitants of the city have heard how the Lord has dried up the Red Sea when you left Egypt and we've heard about how you as Israelites have slain two kings of the Amorites and perhaps because of these things she had heard Rahab had come to believe in their God already and so she tells the spies in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11 she says the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath Knowing Jericho was going to be defeated, Rahab, she asked the spies to promise that they would spare her and her family since she had known or shown them rather kindness in saving their lives. And so the spies, they did. They promised her and her family safety if they would bind a scarlet thread or cord in the window as a sign to them when they invaded her city. And they also made her a promise that she would keep all the information secret that they had shared with her. And so after they made their promises, she lets them down over the wall with this scarlet cord for her house was on the wall and at her instruction the spies fled the city and you know the story they hid in the mountain I think it was three days and uh, the Bible records before they went back and returned to Joshua in contrasting these two women tonight who later became better known to us in scripture we find that there were contrasts other than just their morality as Rebecca had a pedigree being of the extended family of Abraham Rahab was simply a nobody and until she became a follower of the Lord she was a heathen employed in immorality in a pagan city we know Rebecca rather represents a type of the Jews but Rahab represents a type of the Gentiles who enjoyed the extended arm of God in salvation. Rebecca represents Jews who had this inside track of being chosen as a people to receive God's promise. But Rahab represents Gentiles who were not a people but became a people. Brother Dylan, if you'll project for me tonight, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 10. It should be, I think, the third or fourth slide down. We're going to look at this together. He said, which in time past we were not a people but thank God there's been a change we are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now we have obtained mercy if that doesn't look like you and I as Gentile believers tonight I don't know what is honey because thank God he extended an extra arm of salvation that says no matter what you've done how deep in sin you may have fallen I've got grace I've got mercy you're not just going to be a people but you're going to be the people of the living almighty God hallelujah aren't you thankful for that tonight I believe it's in order for us to thank him all across this house tonight God I thank you for filling me with the Holy Ghost I thank you Lord for including me in your salvation plan I want to be that peculiar people that chosen people Jesus hallelujah hallelujah praise God praise God I'm thankful that the Lord extended that arm to us Oh, what a difference a day makes. Those words may have been the title of a popular song in the 1960s, but those were more than just a song to Rebecca. She, uh, when she thought what she thought would just be another uneventful day, unannounced itself, she gets up, she eats breakfast, she begins her duties, and unaware that her trip to the well would eventually hold more than water, as she went about her daily responsibilities, Eliezer arrives at the well outside the city of Nahor, and he stopped and he prayed that the Lord would let him uh, know which maiden was the one for his master's son. And we're going to look at that. He says, let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher. I pray thee, Lord, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness 
unto my master. So before he had finished praying, Rebecca approaches the well. And when Eliezer, uh, when, when Eliezer uh, asked Rebecca for a drink of water, she volunteered not only to give him a drink, but she answers his prayers. To, she also offers to draw water and give his ten camels something to drink. And she proceeded to do that. Being so sure that this was the one uh, Eliezer offered her uh, gold and uh, two bracelets I believe it was and with these gifts he asked whose daughter she was and finding that she was of Abraham's kindred he says well where do you live and she was quick to assure him in Genesis 24 and 25 we have both straw and provender enough we've got room for you to lodge in and so when the family was made aware of the visiting strangers presence they quickly they make sufficient lodging provisions available they freshen up the room they said we've got a place for you to stay and not only that we've got a meal that we're cooking we want you to stay for supper and Eliezer he actually refused to eat until he conquered what he could come to do and so he relates his story and it includes the master's order that he was to find a bride for or his son and then he then told of his arrival at the well and his prayer to the Lord and then Rebecca responding just like he had asked the Lord to do and this is the first time the Bible links the well with marriage now scholars refer to this as a type scene in other words it is placed in the text to help the reader or the listener understand more easily what's going on so when this family hears this story and they had received the gifts that Eliezer brought. They enjoyed a meal. They retire for the night. The next morning, Eliezer asked to be sent on his way along with Rebecca. See, what's happening here is he feels it's unnecessary and, it, and it's pointless, Brother White, for him just to keep lingering around. I found the one. Why well, stay here? I need to take her back to the master's son. I, I need to go ahead. I've, I've already accomplished what the will of the Lord is. I, I had to come and find this, this bride. And so the family responds to his request by saying, in, in, in not so many words, not so fast. <laughs> they said, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten days. After that, she can go. Or actually, they didn't say can. They said after that, she shall go. That's the way they worded it. Um, Abraham's servant, though, he refused. He said, hinder me not. That's the exact wording of the King James. He said, they, they, they agreed finally to say, you know what? We're not going to decide this. Let's let Rebecca decide for herself. Now, that's a, something within itself in this culture because in that culture, the women really didn't have a say. Um, but now they think Rebecca's going to be really tied to home, so we're going to really pull on this guy's heartstrings, and we're going to let her decide. And they really expected her to say, no, I want a few days with mom and dad. But what happened was, uh, in, and, and we read this in Genesis chapter 24 and verse number 58 and I believe they will project this for us tonight they ask her in this scripture they say wilt thou go with this man and she said I will go now, I don't know about you but I can just see into that tent mom and dad's mouth flying wide open uh oh now I want you to note something here Rebecca is willing to accept what she felt was the right thing to do. What daughter of a happy family would be eager to leave her loved ones to go to a strange land and marry a strange man that you've never met before? Yet without hesitation, when she hears the story and hears how the Lord is lining everything up, she says, this is the will of God. I will go. See, many who are faced with these big monumental decisions we a lot of times say, okay, Lord, give me some time to think it over. It wouldn't have been unusual, Brother Seaton, for, for Rebecca to have said, give me a week or two or think, to think about this. You know, I'm, I'm leaving everything I know. It was obvious that she was convinced at what the will of the Lord was for her because there was no indication of hesitancy. She just said, I will go. New horizons are not attained without taking risk. Put it this way, usually God doesn't show you everything you're going to encounter when he asks you to follow him. But you have to step out in faith. And you have to trust. Now that word trust is all good when you can see that step in front of you. But when the lights are out and you don't know which way to go and God says just keep walking. But God, I can't see what's there. That's all right. You've got to trust me. 
It's a lot like Noah coming out of the ark after the flood and after the waters went down and the ground was dry and he and his family exited the ark which had come to rest on a mountain. They didn't know what they might find in that valley when they come down from the mountain. God may not show you the valleys in advance uh, but those areas are where we spend most of our experiences for if we knew in advance what the valleys held we might be a little more reluctant to meet the challenge uh, of new horizons God's trying to take us to but God shows us just enough uh, for us to get out of the ark and to explore where God has brought us to. And if we'll trust Him on the mountaintops, God's going to see you through in the valleys. I'm here to still remind us today the God of the mountain will also still be the God in your valley. Yes, He's God in the good times, but He's still God in the bad times. I got to learn. I got to live my life like Abraham when the Lord said, I've got a land for you. I've got a new horizon horizon out there for you to attain to without the end in sight Abraham took the plunge in faith and God took him to new places that blew his mind and ultimately gave him a new son in his old age who am I preaching to this evening where is God trying to get you to but you can't see it and you don't know how he's going to do it you got to take the plunge by faith and you got to trust God he'll do what he's promised he's going to do but you got to take the plunge. You've got to step out in faith. And so after wandering 40 years in the wilderness, I know I'm toggling back and forth between these stories, but I'm trying to contrast the two tonight quickly. Children of Israel, after wandering 40 years in the wilderness, Israel paused on the east bank of the Jordan River, ready to cross into the land promised Abraham and to his seed. This was, this was the time for which Israel had prayed and longed for. Knowing this, Joshua wants to be sure we're moving according to God's divine plan. And it seems that God often puts water between the world and his people. You see, when God called Abraham to leave his family for a new horizon, Abraham had to cross the Euphrates River, for the Ur of the Chaldees was on the north side of the river. Crossing the Euphrates River, he became the first Hebrew, for the word Hebrew means one from beyond, and it comes from the root word meaning to cross over. It is generally understood that this means the Euphrates River that Abraham crossed over to pursue God's divine plan. When Joshua referred to your fathers, you remember that scripture says your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. He was referring to Abraham's existence in Ur. For flood is from a term that means stream or river. As God put the flood between Noah and the wicked world, as Abraham had to cross, cross the Euphrates, as Israel had to cross the Red Sea, and as Israel had to cross the Jordan River, believers today have to put the water of baptism between the world and themselves. Because those new horizons always involve leaving the old behind and crossing over to the new. So after Israel crossed the Jordan River and entered Canaan, their first challenge was the city of Jericho. Ancient Jericho is thought to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. 800 feet below sea level is considered to be the lowest city on the earth. Little did Jericho or Israel know the strategy that God had planned. He told Joshua and Israel, you march around the city once a day for six days, and on the seventh day you're going to do it seven times. And after that seventh time, the priests are to blow the trumpets and everybody's to shout. The Bible says when they did what God said to do, it didn't make sense. But the Bible says they got the end result they needed. The walls fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him, and they took the city. So as Israel enters Jericho, Joshua says, okay, where's those two boys I sent into Jericho? You need to go to Rahab's house, and you need to go find her and rescue her family. And so the Bible says in Joshua 6 and 25, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel, uh, the Bible says, even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Because of her belief in God, Rahab not only assisted Israel in conquering Jericho, but she was able to save herself and her family. Now, it is noteworthy she believed in the one true God, but it's also noteworthy she was able to influence her family, not only to join her in her home, but to join her in her belief. See, true Christians don't forget about their family. They still reach for family while they're reaching for the other lost people. God help me. I got two kids. And I don't want my, sons to be, my, my son to be lost and my daughter to be lost while I try to win everybody else in Humboldt. 
I got to still reach for family while I'm reaching for others. We all should feel that way. And, and, and so she, how much faith was required? Now think about this. To believe the story of two strangers in the night to the extent that she would, she would agree to cooperate in an act that was traitorous to her city. Obviously, Rahab had to do a lot of believing, not only to accept the story from two strangers, but also risking her life, hiding the spies. If she were caught by the king's men, she would have been killed. Rahab also manifested faith in telling her family who believed her and assembled in her house that faithful day. Because what would happen if her family didn't believe her? They're going to go tell the king, and she's going to die. But she was persuasive enough that they believed also and said, we're going to stay in your house. See, I told you earlier, no one ever moves forward without leaving something behind. We cannot change positions forward or backward without moving. Now, that's deep. When we vacate an area, something is left behind. As Rebecca vacated Haran and Rahab vacated Jericho, they left everything behind. They not only left behind their homes and, their, and some, some of their families physically, but they also left behind their past. Before we explore their gains, I want you to look at what they left behind. All Rebecca knew was Haran. She was probably comfortable and happy there, but being happy in Haran is not always what God has planned for you. See, it's not God's will to make you happy and you still be lost. It's God's will for you to be saved and to enjoy the joy of the Lord. So we have to understand, sometimes I may be in some areas that doesn't make me happy. But if I'm in the will of God, I know I'm going to end up back on the mountaintop again. Sometimes it takes us leaving Haran. It takes us leaving what is familiar to find the will of God for our lives. Rebecca did not know Abraham or his servant. She did not know Canaan. She had never met her future husband. She was on her way to a new life with no hope of ever returning to the old. And it's always easier to hold on to what you know rather than letting go and reaching for what you do not know. And so this is the reason that a lot of people do not respond properly to truth that is revealed to them when they first come to God. They may see the validity of the new truth. I've had people tell me, I, I've, I see baptism in Jesus' name, but I just can't do that yet. Why was it? Because it is difficult to let go of what you've been taught and what you know, especially if it includes traditions that you have held for years. So as Rebecca and Rahab left their homes for new lives, people seeking the Lord today have to leave old habits and old lifestyles for the new things that God wants to bring into their life. And so for these two women to leave everything behind is no different from a new convert leaving everything of the world behind to follow Christ. There was no way for these women to have remained in their homes and to have enjoyed their new lives. There is no way for us as we come to the Lord to keep living our old habits and lifestyles and enjoy new lives in Christ Jesus. But we have to let old things pass away and all things become new. Little did Rebecca know she was, she was going to be a vital link in the genealogical chain that connected Adam to Jesus. And, and the royal line that began with Adam ran all the way to Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were, were three of the most well-known male links in that chain. Rebecca was to be the wife of Isaac, the mother of Jacob. And so when she left Haran and home for everything strange and unfamiliar, it, it probably seemed she was leaving the significant for the insignificant. But Rebecca was to be a key player, folks, in the drama of redemption for Jesus was a descendant of Rebecca. What if Rebecca had chosen not to go with the servant? She would not have been the wife of Isaac or the mother of Jacob, obviously. She would not have been in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, would her refusal have aborted God's plan? No. He would have chosen somebody else and fulfilled his divine purpose. But Rebecca would have suffered for not yielding to the divine will of God. Her life would have been completely different. What am I saying? If we fail to surrender to the will of God, God's still going to have a church. It's not going to be the church that's going to suffer from my lack of talent because I walk out. No, God's church is going to keep going. It's going to be you that will suffer in the long run. 
So I just need to yield myself to the divine will of God. Submit myself to His plan and watch where He leads. And God's going to bless the church. He's always going to bless the church. But He's also going to bless my life in the process. But if I abort that, I'm going to be the loser is what's going to happen. I'm going to be the one to miss out. If, if, you know, it's for this reason, folks, that we have to yield to the will of God to enjoy the best life that we can ever live. Not only did both of these women leave everything to allow themselves to be inserted into God's plan, but they also did so with no plans to return. Their decisions were final. Once they decided to yield to God's plan, there was no going back. And this is the determination that God requires of us to follow Him faithfully. I want you to look at this. I'm going to take you to two passages real quickly in Hebrews chapter 10 and Luke chapter 9. He says, We are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Hebrews 10 and 39. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You are not saved till you get to heaven. Because Demas lost what he once had. Because he loved this present world. There were some worldly things that got a hold of him. Lot's wife used to enjoy the well-watered plains. But they got into sin and living in Gomorrah. And yes, Lot got out, but he lost something. He lost his wife and his kids were never the same either. Cause of some things that happened. There are consequences to our decisions of getting out of the will of God. We don't. All right. If we're going to live for God, we have to sell out completely. I'm going to pastor for two seconds. Don't keep things in the closet that you don't need to be wearing. Don't keep things in the bathroom vanity. That you shouldn't have to put on. Well. Because I don't have any intention of going back. Well it just got quiet but it's right. I don't have any intention of going back. And you know what? I'm robbing myself of the blessing if I keep holding on to yesterday. I have to move to the next horizon. And to do that, i got to leave behind those former things. Now look at Luke chapter 9. He says, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, until that fateful night when two Hebrew spies knocked at her door, Rahab's life was the life of a prostitute. It was as though God knocked on her door with the question, are you going to join the royal family of which physically one day you will be a part? Although we can imagine this now, she couldn't see it then. She had no way of knowing how significant her decision was going to be. And the Bible often appears to be a book of paradoxes. And if, if we were God and, and it tended to select our lineage, would you think you would include a harlot? I wouldn't think so. But God's ways are not our ways. And so contrary to our thinking, he knew that a converted harlot would not represent a weak link in the royal chain. Can I tell you tonight, when you get into the church, you're not the weakest part of the church because you've been in sin. But God says you can stand firm and you can be just as strong as the next person. And when you've done all that you can do, you're going to still have the strength to stand because God is on the inside of you. You're not damaged goods when God forgives you. You may have scars in your past, but Jesus would use those scars to tell his story. And when Thomas would say, I want to see the scars, he said, yeah, Thomas, stick your hand right here. I want you to feel my hands. I want you to see I am who I said I am. I've been through some stuff, but I'm alive, and I'm able to do something for it. Hey, I'm preaching to somebody tonight. You've been through some stuff, but you've come out of it, and you're not dead in your trespasses. You're not dead in your sin any longer, but you're alive in Jesus hallelujah hallelujah praise God I'm hurrying I'm almost done believe it or not I'm almost done oh my of all the houses in Jericho spies end up here come on now God chose that house of all the people he could have used he chooses a woman whose reputation is the lowest in town 
We know habits, but God knows hearts. And for this reason, folks, we've got to be very slow to pass judgment on anybody in any situation. Because, folks, we don't know what God's trying to do. I've told you, I'll pray with people every time they come to pray. You know, We don't know what God's trying to do. God often works plans that are quite involved and difficult to understand until everything's done. So what happens? Rahab marries a man by the name of Salmon. Has a son named Boaz. Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed. He's David's grandfather. And that's how a prostitute ended up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. It would be accurate to assume that Rahab felt her life was meaningless. Living in Jericho and making her living as a harlot was not helpful to her self-esteem. No one knows the moment that there was a spiritual awakening. But at some point, she begins to believe in this God she's hearing about. The God. The one true living God of Israel. And that alone made her life meaningful. So for the canons coming back tonight, and when Rahab and Rebekah were challenged to leave their old lives and to walk toward new horizons, they did so with faith. But they see they had to take the plunge. They didn't know where they were really just all together going, but they knew they were in the will of God. They did so with faith. It had to be faith, for they had no way of knowing how their decisions would play out. Because they believed in God, because they accepted these new challenges as being best for them, they both end up in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their decisions separated them from their past, from their environments, from their livelihoods, their associates. You see, true faith never lives alone. It's always accompanied by actions. James said this in my final scripture tonight, James 2 and 25. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? What does the Bible say? Faith without works is... Was not Rahab the harlot justified by what she did? Friend, you don't have to be an inmate in the prison of your past. Who you were yesterday does not have to be who you are tomorrow. Unpleasant and sinful past are never never able to forge chains so strong that they cannot be broken by a will to escape and have a better life. But with the help of God, new horizons can be reached and attained and enjoyed if we step out in faith and walk toward them. Stand with me tonight as the two women had to leave everything behind to enjoy the fruit of the future. Folks, we have to forsake all to follow God. If our faith is in Jesus and we trust Him completely, you don't have to know the future for you to get up tomorrow and live for God. Understanding God is not necessary for believing Him. So I will tell you, there's going to be times you're not going to understand what God's doing. I've went through low moments in my life, Brother Charles, I didn't understand what God was doing. But I had to still trust Him. Job had to come to this place. I look to the left, I look to the right, I look in front of me, I look behind me, I can't see Him. But He knows the way that I take. I may not know what direction really to go right now, but he knows where I'm at right now, and I'm trying to do my best, and I'm living in the will of God. I've done nothing at this point. Folks, we have to take the plunge. We have to extend our faith and allow God to lift us to new horizons, believing that in the process, God will take care of us. Oh, would you lift your hands? Let's love the Lord together today. God, I give myself to you. Lord, I commit myself to your plan. Lord, I'm going to follow the will of God in my life. Would you begin to tell the Lord that as they begin to sing tonight? God, I commit myself to your will, Jesus. Help us today, O Lord, to walk in your will and your favor. I'm believing, O Lord, in your promises today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So leave me, God. 